I love this game. Dungeon Siege was released in 2002 by Gas Powered Games. It was released to critical acclaim by critics and fans, selling over 1.7 million copies in total. The game is a mix between a classic CRPG with managing a huge party and Diablo's hack and slash combat. Now, considering the fact that the game is so old, you're gonna have some problems with the resolution. There is a way to get 1920 resolution on your screen. The downside is going to be that your characters and inventory screen will be smaller than usual, but you will have a bigger overview around you. Unfortunately, the game's premise is weak. It's every generic fancy story you've ever heard. It's just... An ancient evil has awakened, and it's up to you, the chosen one, to save the world. So you will travel through a wide array of environments, meet a diverse amount of potential party members, an old friend approaches you, and you are immediately thrown into action against the evil Krugs. The main thing you will be doing in this game is combat. The combat might be based on Diablo 2, but it differs in terms of the hack and slash combat, whereas in Diablo 2 you spam click for every attack, but here in Dungeon Siege you just need to press once and your character will automatically attack the target until it's dead. It can become a little bit tedious towards the later parts of the game, as a lot of situations when you have full party becomes quite monotonous due to no real changes except for, well, the enemies. You can pretty much play the game the same way all the way through without changing tactics from start to finish. There are four different playstyles in the game. The most common one, the classic warrior. There is also archer build. And there are two different kinds of magic in this game, which is quite unique. You have the combat magic and nature magic. I will come back to these two later and what differences between them are. You also have three base stats, Strength, Dexterity, and Intelligence. For Warriors and Archers, the base stats are the most crucial, as they determine what level of gear you can use. Magic, however, is more reliant on the skills of their respective schools, as the higher level you are, the more powerful spells you can equip. But the Intelligence stat, on the other hand, determines what gear you can equip, such as staffs, robes, hats, etc. A character you create can become anything, you start as a blank slate. And that's one of the more unique aspects of the game, that you can actually become anything with any character as long as you train the specific skill. You are able to have a party of 8 people at any time. You will slowly gain more party members further along the game. You can also dismiss a party member at any point, even your main character. Well. I guess he was not the chosen one. There are also some hilarious reactions from said party members when they leave. For example, how Merrick reacts. What? You've got the gall to dismiss the Grand Mage of the Tenth Legion? Third in line to the throne of the kingdom? I certainly... And yeah, the cool thing though is, if you want everyone in the party, they could be warriors, archers or mages. It's pretty funny seeing 8 people use magic, melee or range attacks, but I would recommend that you do a balanced party for it's often the best. There are a wide array of spells for you to use, from buffs, debuffs, healing, summonings and damage spells. The difference between nature and combat magic is more that combat is using fire and metal magic, while nature spells is more focused on buffing and using lightning spells. Both can be used as healers. The issue with healers though are the fact that they do not gain a lot of XP when only healing, which means they will unfortunately become useless really fast, and you will replace that party member with a new one almost immediately when you find a new mage. You will pick up a lot of loot throughout the game. You can pick up everything that ain't nailed to the ground. Each character has a restricted amount of bag space, which further incentivizes you to sell everything from your bags when you reach a trader, or if you feel like you're lacking space for your stuff. You can use one or more character slots to recruit mules. 
who can carry many times more stuff than any regular party member. And this game will turn you into an economist, as you will mid-max all your gear and gold each time you come to a town. In many games, I have not really cared about gold or gear. For example, in Skyrim, it becomes kinda redundant fast. In Dungeon Siege though, money is everything. Money is used to buy party members who are expensive. You need to buy gear, spells, and different potions. You can never have enough gold in this game. This management becomes especially clear when you have to handle 8 different characters' equipment, potion, spells, and space, etc. And the fun thing about gearing these characters is if you have, for example, Three warriors, you will have one with more strength than others and he has better gear. And when he will find something better to equip, he will hand down his old gear to the warrior who has less strength than him. And then that armor will go to the other person below him. So it's uh, it's kind of like you're, uh, uh, you're, you're a bunch of family members just handing down your clothes <laughs> through generations. One of the more unique things about this game though is how every time you come to a new region of the game where you meet new enemies, you will be overwhelmed and struggle against them at first. But when you make it further in, you will start to beat these enemies with ease as you get better stats and gear. And then the loop will restart all over again until the end of the game. I have not found many games that have had such balance in terms of difficulty and progression like in Dungeon Siege. The game becomes quite unfair a lot of times, and there is a stark contrast between the different difficulties. Easy? It's way too easy. You have to try to die. It's almost impossible to die unless you screw up. And normal? It feels like hard difficulty. And hard is next to impossible, unless you completely mid-max the game. And there are many difficulty spikes throughout the game, and some of them just feels unfair, especially when you reach the swamp area and the goblin tunnels. One example is how you need to put your whole party on a lift, and on the other side is full of enemies that deal AoE damage. And since all of your characters are stuck on the lift when they come to the other side, your casters who does not have a lot of defense, will almost immediately die. And this has become so annoying when, in later parts of the game, more and more enemies gain these AoE attacks. There are also some issues in terms of uh, the combat, or rather, auto-attacking. My characters would constantly stop attacking their enemies after the one I targeted is killed. They don't run towards enemies if they are attacked, and instead just stay there idle, taking damage. And I understand this from a perspective of the developers, as they want to give the player more control and not having your characters run away from the party, splitting them up. But at the same time, there are enemies that actively run away when their health is low, and your party members will chase them, further aggroing more, so it's a weird and annoying thing most of the times. There are two ways of healing yourself in the game. It's either by a healing spell, or by drinking a health potion. And unlike Diablo 2, where you drink the potion and you instantly gain back your health, and you can keep attacking as if nothing happened, in Dungeon Siege though, there is a short pause while the character is drinking the potion, making it possible that your character needs the perma drink unable to do anything when they are surrounded and attacked. When one of your characters loses all their health, they will fall to the ground unable to do anything, but if the enemy attacks them while they are down, they could die, which means they will drop all their gear and loot on the ground. You can, however, resurrect them with a resurrection spell or a scroll if you don't have a magic user that can use resurrection. I did not really know this, so when one of my party members died, I had no mage that could resurrect him, and I didn't know about these resurrection scrolls, so I ran probably away for 15 to 20 minutes, and then I saw the resurrection scroll in the bag, and I had to run back, and I managed to resurrect him. Unfortunately as well, some enemies are excruciatingly annoying to kill, especially the summoners in the swamp who will just run away when you run towards them, which aggros even more enemies around them, and they just summon more, and they, they just... The swamp is the worst 
part of this game by far. There are also a lot of side quests scattered around the map, so I suggest you talk to every NPC you find when you come into town. At least in this game they will not tell their entire life story to you and it's just a few lines. And there are some good rewards in terms of experience and gear if you finish these quests. Also, what's cool and unique about this game is when you, in most cases, you do a quest, you pick up a quest, you finish the quest, and then you run back to the quest giver and you get the reward. But in Dungeon Siege, almost every single quest you pick up and you finish, you get all the experience and the gear when you finish it, you know, at the quests. So you don't need to run back to the quest giver to gain a reward. There is one really cool side quest towards the end of the game though, which is uh, you are to track down and kill a huge black dragon, which is almost harder to beat than the last boss. But again, this is completely optional if you want some extra nice gear, and if you are up for a challenge. The loot system though, it can be an issue since it's based on a lot of RNG. So if you are unlucky, you won't get any good gear upgrades. This also becomes really apparent in the last part of the game when you enter the Altar of the Stars and you open these legendary chests that contain said weapons from Legends of the Past. And what do I get? I get two legendary staffs that my mages can't use due to not having enough intelligence. And two legendary bows. But I got no melee weapons when most of my party members are melee users. And that's just unfortunately some pure bullshit. Why the game did not have a set loot table in this room for all three main types is a huge oversight of the developers. And it really just pisses you off. It makes it less cool towards the end. It's all oh, these legendary weapons, but it's just RNG. The story though... Damn it! what is with these games I review when just games having an awful story, or generic ones rather. And there's not just, there is not much to say here. It's the classic, hundreds of years ago, the 10th legion managed to imprison the prime evil with the help of sorcery. But now with the grand mage Merrick gone, without a trace, evil has begun to rise again. You are the chosen one, a farmer, of course who is interrupted in daily work by an old friend who warns you that the evil Krugs are destroying the village, and in his last breath he gives you a mission to get to Stonebridge to meet Jorn. You are later given the mission to get to the city of Glacern to find the missing mage Merrick. After freeing Merrick from his frozen tomb, he informs the main character that his staff has gone missing and the staff is the key to locking away evil again for good. The staff resides in the underground city ruled by goblins. And when you gain the staff, you get the final mission. Get to Castle Ebb and find the king. I mean, throughout the game you will also explore a prehistoric land where cavemen will attack you. And after having killed them all and reached their city, they will start to pray to you, and the game calls it a surrender. The surrender of the Droog meant the safety of the kingdom had been secured, but... I call it something else. I'm a war criminal! Go, let's go! Guys, guys, guys! When finding the king in Castle Ebb, you are to find the hidden cache of the Altar of Stars, where the legend said legendary weapons, blah blah blah, can you be using its prime evil, blah blah blah, with the generic name of blah blah blah. You kill him, he has three faces, pretty cool, there's an awful cutscene at the end, and the game is suddenly over. The story is unfortunately weak. The visuals and atmosphere in this game are just beautiful though. And also did I mention, this game has no loading screens, and it's quite amazing the game has no, you know, visible loading screens. There are some hidden ones though. And all enemies who die do not respawn again. So if you backtrack to an area where you have killed everything, it will just be empty. Um, and this, there are some hidden loading screens though. And these are probably set in the elevators you're going to be taking a lot. But 
they do not take you out of the experience, and they actually make total sense. The music though is very distinct in every location of the map, with some of them being really beautiful and just fitting the setting, especially in Glacier. And there is something about winter music that always gets me. You will explore almost everything that can be in a fantasy setting, and it really feels like you are making a long journey towards your goal, always but slowly progressing. And of course, you start small, you start on your small farm, and you end up in the royal castle of the 10th legion. And on your way, you will encounter crypts, mines, snow landscapes, ice tunnels, forests, swamps crystal caves, underground tunnels, with futuristic equipment, and you kinda go back in time...ish? And for a game that came out in 2002, there are some impressive visuals here. The voice acting is forgettable. It's not bad, it's just dull. If you've come looking for help, you'll not get much here. What the Krug couldn't carry off in a wagon, they smashed up or burned. They even put Gravemaker, my blessed old cat. Peace. We are victims all of these horrid Sek. In centuries past, the Sek hunted us near to extinction. With only a name given by a dying friend, our beleaguered hero entered the battle-worn gates of Stonebridge. Who could know then? that the arrival of one humble farmer from the fields would change the very course of the kingdom. And breaking off the beaten path is often a good option since, you know, a lot of loot and hidden areas such as chests, bosses, and etc. can be found here. There are also sometimes a fork in the road that you can discover, but they always end up at the same place, and you will probably discover both since you want all of that experience. And also the game features a wide array of enemies, and these are pretty generic enemies, and it's pretty much anything you can imagine, from robots, cyborgs, skeletons, gargoyles, cavemen, beholders, cyclops, wolves, dragons, fairies, dogs, etc. Some of these areas, though, will make the game feel like a horror game, especially when you reach one of the earlier locations called the Westwind Cross, where you will face all types of horrors. And if you have arachnophobia, unfortunately I cannot recommend this game for you. There are a lot of spiders here. There is also a really interesting enemy towards the end of the game that is trapped in a cage and oh my god. There is also an expansion for the game, Legends of Arana. And for many fans, it was a welcome addition that further expanded on what was good about the original with more and new gear, more loot and new monsters and a setting. Uh, again, new story, uh, kinda weak. And a uh, pretty new lens since there was a green lash jungle theme in this game. I will not really explore it more than this though. There were also two sequels with the same name, Dungeon Siege 2 and free. Unfortunately, they only got worse with each installment. And hell, you can't even classify the third game as part of the series since it's more or less just a mobile game. And it's quite unfortunate that this IP is put on ice, and we will probably not see a game like Dungeon Siege ever again. Oh yeah, there was also a movie based on the game. Yeah! So, we can't have movies or shows of some of the best video games ever made, but there was a movie... Krug. Savage armed Krug. 
They killed off our entire scouting party. Sacrilege. I believe it was Galleon. He has fallen into madness. The game is around 12 to 16 hours long, depending on how you play it. This mostly depends if you are used to these kinds of games, or if you want to explore pretty much everything, do all the side quests, etc. But I did them all, and uh, it didn't really take that much time in the end. All in all though, Dungeon Siege, though flawed in some ways, is a beautiful classic that deserves some love, and you should really try it out. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.